I guess it's the first official enlightening lunch of the semester, although uh, my state of the school was technically, I guess, an enlightening lunch. Uh, today, it is a privilege to introduce Bob Cook Deegan, uh, who is a professor in the School for the Future of Innovation and Society. His duty station, however, is Washington, D.C., um, and Bob really is, I think, a sort of D.C. creature, even though in his previous academic appointment, he was uh, uh, at Duke. He really is a sort of consummate uh, policy analyst, and, and uh, from the perspective of science and technology policy, sort of D.C. insider. Um, many of you may not know that Bob was my second employer in Washington, D.C. Uh, I had spent the summer after my junior year in D uh, junior year as an undergraduate in D.C. working with AAAS, where I spent work on what was then the beginnings of the Human Genome Initiative, and in writing an undergraduate thesis about that, uh, had interviewed Bob and sent him a copy of my thesis, and he said, well, why don't you come work with us, because we're now doing, at the Office of Technology Assessment, the um, then Office of Technology Assessment, the late great Office of Technology Assessment, um, a study about the Human Genome Initiative. So Bob invited me to uh, work in D.C. with him, and it was a great pleasure a couple years ago to return the paper um, and invite Bob to uh, work for ASU. Um, with no further ado, Bob Kutigan. Just to finish that story a little bit, because I just to be reminded of it. So this is 1987. Uh, Dave has finished his undergrad. He hasn't yet gone to MIT for the graduate work, and um, he's kicking around. And Think about it, so the idea of the Human Genome Project pops up at three places independently in the middle of 1985, between May and October of 1985, and the reaction of the scientific community to this idea of let's sequence the human genome is that's a really stupid, crazy idea, and it's directly relevant to what I'm going to talk about. Why was it a stupid, crazy idea? Well, because the largest genome that had been sequenced up until that <coughs> point was about 174,000 base pairs which sounds like a lot, A's, G's, T's, and C's, 174,000 of them in a row. That was a virus, the, the high X174 virus. Um, but uh, even the lowly bacterium Escherichia coli had not been sequenced at that point and was thought to be way too complicated given the sequencing technologies of the day. But lo and behold, this idea caught hold and some money started being thrown at it by the Department of Energy but when the National Institutes of Health, that does both, most biomedical research in the United States, got wind of it, it felt like an incursion into its territory. And think about it, who's going to resolve a conflict between NIH, which is in the Department of Health and Human Services, and the Department of Energy, which is its own department, created by Jimmy Carter in the mid-1970s? Mid um, so who's going to resolve that? Well, there are two places where budgets converge and decisions about health policy and science policy are made. One is the Office of Management and Budget, which is part of the President's office. So they were working around, are we going to have a budget at NIH and Department of Energy, or just one budget, or how's that going to work? And the other place it's going to land is the U.S. Congress through the appropriations process. So we're wondering how are we going to structure, who's going to, who's going to lead the project? Both one or the other of these organizations, or are they going to work together somehow? Um, and uh, how much money is going to go for it? In order to decide how much money to allocate for the Human Genome Project, we had to figure out how much it was going to cost. So I actually sent Dave out. I can't remember why I didn't go. But um, Dave went out to the National Institutes of Health to talk to another person who is now working at ASU, Rachel Levinson, who was kind of the point person for NIH and trying to figure out all the stuff, that, all the politics of should there be a human genome project. And I'd send them out there to say, hey, could you give us some cost figures? We need, we need a budget sheet to hand over to the appropriators if they're going to do a human genome project. And Rachel's response to Dave was, we, we can gather you the numbers that are being spent right now <coughs> on mapping and sequencing operations. But we don't do stuff like think about what the cost should be out. And you guys are at the Office of Technology Assessment. You guys do workshops. Why don't you do a workshop? So Dave had the job of organizing a workshop that involved Jim Watson. It was chaired by Paul Berg. Uh, Walter Gilbert was there. 
and uh, the head of the genome office at uh, NIH at that time, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, Ruth Kirstein, was also there. So an undergraduate is organizing three Nobel laureates and a future Nobel laureate, John Salston, um, to come to Washington to talk about how are we going to cost out the Human Genome Project, which became the nexus. Figuring out the budget becomes the nexus for deciding is there going to be a project, and if so, how big, and what does it look like? So um, it was a crucial workshop where a lot of the politics played out. It was actually at that workshop where John Sulston realized that Jim Watson aspired to be the head of the NIH arm of the Human Genome Project and outed him in front of this whole audience of, of elite uh, professionals. So it's a really, really interesting, uh, and that transcript is still available uh, in the public at the at the archive at uh, Georgetown University. So enough about that. It's relevant to what we're talking about today. Um, and I'm talking about one of the strains of research that uh, we've been engaged in since I came to ASU. Uh, it's, in fact, this, the, a lot of this work actually began when I was in transition from uh, Duke to, um, to ASU. We've got this incredible capacity now for doing sequencing. And back in the 1980s, it seemed crazy to be able to do a sequence of the human genome, which is a composite, a reference genome <coughs> of what a human sequence would look like. It was completely and utterly unthinkable that we would be able to sequence a person's genome in any sort of realistic time frame. But here we are in 2018. And we can actually do a genome in a few hours and interpret it in a few days later um, by the combination of DNA sequencing technology and computational power. And those two technologies have converged to create all sorts of technical capacities. So the DNA sequencing is now ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Um, and we're uh, doing a lot of it. So that actually poses a problem. So think about. Um, what we know um, and what we don't know. We know there are lots of genes. So how many genes are there in the human genome? Anybody know? Uh, <laughs> depends on whether you include coding and non-coding for proteins, but if it's co just coding for proteins, it's, it's about 25,000. Okay, so, so the estimates these days after the publications were about 22,000. Two weeks ago, a publication came out and said, no, three or 4,000 of those are pseudogenes, so they aren't really coding for things. So maybe it's 19,000. And we're going to be going back and forth. Um, when the Genome Project was being put together, uh, Jim Watson's estimate was 100,000. I was at 140,000. These are really smart people who know a lot about genetics. We have no idea how many genes there are. It's somewhere in the order of 20,000. <coughs> and it's going to take us a while to figure that out. Um, but actually, to make meaning of that, we're going to detect, we can do the sequencing now. But think about it, in order to interpret whether a variation in that <coughs> sequence, so your genome differs from the reference genome at this position on chromosome 21, does that mean anything? How are you going to figure that out? Well, what you're going to have to do is keep track of those sequences in lots of people over lots of time and figure out what happens to them. Marry the information about the genomic sequence to the information you know about what happens to that person. Do that for lots and lots of people, and then eventually we're going to figure out what these variations mean. So the game has changed from the Human Genome Project, which is construct a reference genome, to understanding the meaning of variations from that genome, which is what we actually care about. So that's where we are. We got lots of genes. We're going to have to sample and connect that to lots of time, different times in their lifetime, lots of people. And we're going to have to link it to what happens to those people. Health outcomes, environmental exposures, what they eat, whether they exercise, things like that. So just to make it a little bit more realistic, let me ground it in some stuff that's really happened. Um, and I'm going to give you one hypothetical case that's directly related to what I'm going to talk about with breast and ovarian cancer, which will be the case study that I really focus on. And then I'm going to give you a, a case study of a real case of a real person uh, who died as a consequence of misinterpreting genetic information. So here's a situation that actually could happen any day, might have actually already happened. 
somebody who's living in Canada, but whose parents are from two other parts of the world, um, gets a genetic test because maybe somebody in her family uh, had cancer. Um, her sister got it and an aunt got it. So is she in a high-risk family or not? Well, kind of, kind of not. She doesn't actually meet the risk criteria that would say yes, insurance could cover, should cover this test. But there's enough there that you might actually, she might actually care enough to find out if she's at risk of one of these forms of mutation that's associated with high risk of breast and ovarian cancer, the Angelina Jolie situation. Um, so she gets her genes sequenced and they find that there is a variant in her gene, in one of these two genes that was first associated with breast and ovarian cancer. So is that clinically significant or not? Well, we actually don't know how to interpret it. So how are we gonna solve that problem over time? There's genetic testing going on all over the world. We're discovering variants all the time. In those two genes, you'll see on a later slide, we've identified over 20,000 variants in those two genes, and we know that we've got about 60,000 still to go. Just by theory, because in, we can just say, if you vary one base pair at a time, you're going to end up with 80,000 variants in these two genes just for the sequence variations, not, all, not accounting for rearrangements and, and all sorts of things like that. So here we've got the kind of clinical problem that's going to face us, and how are we going to solve this problem? No laboratory in the world is going to do all the tests on all the populations that are needed to be able to understand this question. We're going to have to pool information about the pedigree, the family history, link it to the genomic data, and link it to whether people develop cancer or not, and pull those pieces of information into some sort of interpretive framework that allows us to say, yes, this is a high-risk mutation, this person's at risk, she should think very seriously about having both breast removed to reduce her risk and both ovaries and fallopian tubes. Those are actually, it's the ovarian cancer risk that people worry about the most because there actually is no easy way to detect ovarian and uh, fallopian tube cancers. So people tend to be diagnosed at very late stages and are a very, very high risk if they develop those cancers. Breast cancer you can detect earlier through mammography and through palpation. So that's one case. We're trying to solve that problem. Here's another case. Um, this is a child who died uh, 10 years ago now. And uh, he died because they actually, at the lab that did the work, they actually detected a variant that had only been found in one child before who had catastrophically bad epilepsy very early in her life. Um, the girl who had the original variant is actually still alive in Canada. Uh, you can see a picture of her riding a horse. She's about 13 or 14 years old. She's disabled, but she's alive. And she's alive because they figured out that her variation was associated with a defect in one of the channels in neurons in the brain that uh, when the voltage changes, it allows the transmission of a signal. So it's a voltage-gated uh, uh, sodium channel. And they detected this variant, and they changed the drugs that you normally treat epilepsy with. The drugs you usually use to treat epilepsy actually make this syndrome much worse because they block sodium channels. So with this result, they changed her drugs, and she's still alive a decade later. The child who had this mutation, however, they said, oh, we don't know what this variant means. We've never seen it before, despite the fact that the lab that had done the test had actually co-authored a paper that identified the mutation in the Canadian girl. Um, and that was actually published about two months before the test was done up in the Boston area. So they actually kept treating this child with the drugs that make the syndrome worse. Six months later, two-year-old dies. You can see a picture of him opening a present the day before he died, and then he dies the next day in uncontrollable epilepsy. So what we have here is a system where the information existed, but the links between that information about a genomic variant, the clinical syndrome, and the life of a specific child the links were not made because the system didn't work. 
And um, in fact, if you go to the databases about this gene, even now, this child's information has not been put into the publicly available databases yet, despite the fact that there's a court case that's been going on for four years in South Carolina. So this is a, this is a system problem. This is a classic science policy problem of we need to connect the dots and we need to build a system that we can trust to make really faithful decisions where people die if you don't connect the dots appropriately. So that's the situation that we face. And let me put a little wrinkle in it. It's not just interpreting information, it's also negotiating the, the incredible complexity of the intellectual property system. So what you're looking at here, you don't need to look at the details, just look at the shape of the curve. Um, what you're looking at is patents that have been granted in the United States um, for things that refer in their claims, the part of the patent that does the legal work, says this is what my invention is, and you can't use it without my permission. Um, these have been granted on things that have something to do with a DNA or an RNA molecule. So what you see is a lot of patents, uh, averaging about 4,000 a year, You'll also see during the Human Genome Project, which is going on right here, there's an exponential rise in the number of patents being granted and then a drop. That's partly because it became harder to get these patents as science progressed. And it's also because the patent office itself changed the criteria and raised the threshold for getting DNA patents. But what's that got to do with the real world? Well, it turns out if you ask people if you can patent uh, a gene, um, and say do a genetic test based on it, say a test for breast and ovarian cancer, once the two genes that are associated with that have been discovered, we'll get to that in a minute. What does the public think of that? And you'll see a survey of English language literature that was done by folks up in, in uh, Alberta. Uh, in, this is Australia, Canada, UK, and the United States. The English language literature for the whole world. What's the public think about patenting genes? Well, red means we don't like it. Yellow means, eh, it's kind of who knows. And black is, yeah, it's okay, it's a good idea. Hmm. Um, any, anybody have any guesses about where the black is coming from in the United States? It's the only place that's got a substantial, favorable attitude towards gene patenting. Salt Lake City, Myriad Genetics is a spin-out company that had the patents on BRCA1 and 2, and so they get some positive press in, um, in the Salt Lake City area. This is, so when something is controversial and it enters the world, it starts popping up in reports that are done for Congress or for the executive branch or for the UK government or the French government. This is an assembly of the cases that are mentioned in policy reports going to national governments all over the world that say something about gene patents and genetic testing. And you'll see two really big graphs. One is a company, Myriad Genetics, and the other is a gene, which is BRCA1 and 2. The point being, this controversy over access to genetic testing and the interaction with gene patents really, really focused on one disease and one company, Myriad Genetics in Salt Lake City, and these two genes, BRCA1 and 2, over which they had patent rights. So in the United States, Myriad established a service monopoly. If you wanted to get tested for your risk of breast and ovarian cancer in the United States up until 2013, there was only one place to go. Actually, there were two places. You could go to Mary Claire King at the University of Washington because they never were going to sue her. She was the heroine, and I'll, sh I'll show that, that story in a minute. But if you wanted commercial testing, you would go to Marriott Genetics, and they did well over a million tests in the United States before their patent monopoly was broken. Here's the story of the discovery of these two crucial genes. This guy is Mark Skolnick. He's a scientist at the University of Utah who also co-founded the company Marriott Genetics. Um, he looks like you, Bob. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't I wish. I wish I had his bankroll, right? Um, and uh, he actually co-founded that company with Wally Earth. Gilbert, who was there at the, at the beginning of the Human Genome Project. Um, so they discovered, they didn't discover that there was a gene to be found, because Mary Claire King did that in 1990. She found 
oh, there's a gene to be found on chromosome 17 that's associated with breast and ovarian cancer. But she hadn't found the DNA and the sequence variations, and that was left to other people. There's a really furious race that involved about a dozen labs all over the world. Um, but that race was won by Myriad Genetics and Mark Skolnick's team at the University of Utah and this spin-out company, Myriad Genetics. This is Andy Futrial, who was working at NIH at the time. He's on the original patent for BRCA1, the first gene. And then this guy, Mike Stratton, who's the head of the, uh, the Sanger Institute in, um, in Cambridge, uh, the UK. Uh, he led the team that found the second breast cancer gene on chromosome 13, BRCA2. <laughs> this guy was on both teams and is a co-inventor on both of the original patents. Now, the patent situation is really a mess. And I'm not going to go deeply into it except to summarize in the following sense. The first patent actually went to a company other than Myriad because they got through the patent office, office faster. They had good patent lawyers. Uh, but the second patent went to Myriad Genetics who immediately countersued. They'd already been sued by this first company. They immediately countersued the day after they got their first patent. And it was litigated. Um, it actually, it, it didn't go to court, it was settled out of court, and Myriad at that point started driving all the other labs that were offering testing in the United States out of the business by sending a nasty letter saying, we're gonna sue you too. Uh, so they knocked out their main competitor, got the rights to the genes, um, and became a service monopoly in the United States. They also sued the University of Pennsylvania. University of Pennsylvania backed away and said, we're gonna stop doing testing in our labs. Um, so they basically won, and for a long time that was the story. But then along came Tanya Simoncelli. Now some of you in this room have heard her speak. She was at the time working at the American Civil Liberties Union as a science and tech person. She was hired originally to do stuff like environment stuff and civil rights. Um, but one of her bosses at some point she mentioned, they, they were talking about what could we do that would be useful for the world. And she mentioned, well, you know, maybe we could do something about gene patents. And her boss, who's a constitutional scholar and litigator, basically said, so who can we sue? <laughs> he said, the first thing he said is, that can't possibly be true. And this is probably what's going through your heads, if this is the first time you've thought about gene patents. It makes no sense. You can't patent a gene. That's a discovery. That's something that exists in nature. How in the world could you patent that? But it was conventional wisdom that you could. And every jurisdiction in the world has allowed patenting of genes. But ACLU decided to make this a case. They filed suit against um, Myriad and uh, took it all the way up to the Supreme Court. I'm going to short circuit a lot of legal wrangling and stuff like that that took <coughs> about four years. Um, and uh, in the meantime, incidentally, this is Mary Claire King, who was the heroine who did the uh, work first at Berkeley and then at University of Washington. Um, and this is Joanna Rudnick, who is herself a carrier of a variant that's associated with cancer. Um, she did a whole film about whether she should get genetic testing and whether if she, if she was positive, which she is, um, what she should do about it, should she get surgery. She decided to delay surgery until she had kids. She had kids and got breast cancer. So she is now a breast cancer survivor and she's an activist in this field. And I use her film in some of my teaching. Where this led to was uh, pigs fly. So that was the headline the day that the district court um, in, um, in Manhattan said, actually, you know what? We've been patenting genes for 30 years, but that makes no sense. These patents are invalid. That district court decision made by an 87-year-old, then 87, he's now 93, uh, William Sweet, um, excuse me, Robert Sweet, um, completely turned the patent law on its head and pigs fly became the moniker. This is actually what was happening at the Supreme Court on uh, April 12th, or excuse me, April 15th of 2013. Protesters out front saying, you can't patent my genes. Here's Eric Lander who had written a, a, a brief to the Supreme Court that six of the justices quoted in the oral arguments. Direct influence of a scientist saying, hey, it makes no sense to allow patenting of genes as they are found in nature. Um, and then this is a whole bunch of our students. We, we went, woke up at 3 o'clock to get in line so we could actually hear the, the oral arguments. A month before that, the world had learned about Angelina Jolie, 
So she's part of the mix by now, um, and she's on the, the cover of Time magazine before the Supreme Court makes its final decision. So here's the situation. We've just decided there's no longer a patent monopoly in the United States. Now other labs, even, in fact, by noon that day, the, the Supreme Court decision came out at about 10.30 in the morning. Um, and by noon that day, the New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera, had all run their stories. And two companies had announced they're going to start offering BRCA testing. And by the end of that year, there were about 13 or 14 labs in the United States offering testing. So think about it. All these labs are now offering testing in these two genes and others that are associated with cancer. And they're generating lots of information about the sequencing. But we still have to figure out which of these variations are associated with the risk of cancer. So we've got an information problem. How do we deal with an information problem when many labs all over the world are generating the information about people who are in health systems all over the world, covered in different ways, putting the information into different databases, uh, health systems, et cetera. Well, the theory that we have for trying to get cooperation among communities of people is from uh, Eleanor Ostrom, who spent her whole career showing <coughs> that the tragedy of commons doesn't have to end in tragedy. The tragedy of the commons is if you've got a common resource and everybody has an incentive to use that resource, you're likely to, de to deplete it. So think about a pasture with multiple farmers that want to put their sheep on it, which is the example he used in his classic now 50-year-old essay. Or think of a fishery, the incentive to overfish. So how do human beings deal with that? You can do two things. in. In, as Garrett Hardin was thinking about it 50 years ago, you can either say government steps in and runs it, and we're Americans, so we never think that's going to work, right? And the other thing is you let the market decide. Well, actually, in this situation, by definition, the market isn't going to make the right decisions. It's going to set up incentives for everybody to deplete the very resource that's valuable over the long term because everybody has an individual incentive that's at odds with if everybody behaves the same way, it's going to deplete the resource. So Eleanor Ostrom observed, you know what? It doesn't have to end in tragedy. There are all sorts of common pool resources that we manage quite well. So she developed the set of theories, and she observed real things. Her methodology was go out and look at how people have solved this problem and figure out how they've done that. So she came up with a set of rules, kind of heuristics, that are general rules of, uh, of behavior that when people talk to each other, they can develop a set of rules and play by them, and they can sustain a resource over the long term. Now, take that idea and now apply it to data. Now, the danger with data is not so much that you're going to deplete it, because everybody using information and data actually don't diminish the value of anybody else being able to use it. So the usual problem with data is not that it's going to be depleted, but rather that it won't be used to maximally do the good things that we can do with the data. So it's the tragedy not of the commons, what people in uh, law and economics and politics have talked about is the tragedy of the anti-commons, which unfortunately is kind of planted itself in our brains. Nobody ever knows what you're talking about if you raise that at a cocktail party. But the concept is, if what you do is wrap up information with packets of ownership rights and reasons for people to keep it to themselves, it will not be shared in such a way that we can maximize the benefits that we derive from it. So it's underutilization of data and common resources. And that's the problem that we face in connection with the genomic data that we're talking about. So we started studying this through this grant that is channeled through ASU and Baylor uh, started about three years ago. And how are we dealing with this in the real world? What you're looking at here, have, have any of you heard of the Bermuda Principles for data sharing? Is Dave really the only one in the room? So this is a touchstone of open science. This is the scribbling of John Sulston, who just died in March, who was the head of the Sanger Institute. 
who scribbled on the board in Bermuda in 1996 when the Human Genome Project had reached the point when it made sense to start doing large-scale sequencing. NIH and other funders all over the world were beginning to say, hey, let's scale up and let's start doing a lot of sequencing. So think about it. You're about to actually do the reference sequence for the human genome. And you got labs in Japan, France, the UK, the United States, and Germany that have all formed a kind of a consortium. They're all going to get funding to do high throughput sequencing, which in those days was more than a, a million base pairs a day, which is about two minutes of sequencing right now. But um, they had to figure out, well, who's going to sequence with which pieces of the genome? And when somebody says they're going to sequence it, how can we trust that they're actually going to sequence it to high quality and we can actually trust the data? So they, had, they were about to do this. They met in Bermuda. They met in Bermuda because it was halfway between the US and Europe so that nobody could say they owned the place. The weather was miserable. It was February, so it doesn't, don't, don't think about exotic uh, days at the beach. They were actually working pretty hard, and the weather was miserable. And they forged an agreement that said each lab that's going to be funded through these channels as part of this consortium have to share their data, not at time of publication, but the day they generate it. So those are the Bermuda principles for data sharing. This has become the touchstone for open science, not just for genomics, but for all sorts of domains of science. And this is uh, John Solston's uh, handwriting uh, from 1996. We got this photo from, from a guy, who, uh, from Rick Myers, who's uh, now in Alabama at the Hudson Alpha Institute. So that's complete open. That means you generate your data and you make it available to everybody on a public site at the end of the day. At the other end, whoops, let's get past that. There we go. At the other end, we have what many scientists characterize and the, the graphic designer who's, who was my former research assistant. This is the opposite end of the spectrum of proprietary science, which was myriad genetics as we said, had a service monopoly for, from 1996 to 2013. So more than 15 years where they were the only place in the United States that you could get sequencing of these two genes. So starting in 2004, up until 2004, they were sharing their data with public databases so everybody could see it and we could all use it to interpret the clinical meaning and the significance of the variants that they were coming across. But in November of 2004, they had hired somebody from, I think he was from Johnson & Johnson. He's now the CEO of the company. He basically said, why are we giving away this information? It's going to be valuable, and it won't expire when the patents expire. So 10 years before their patents are set to expire, they stop sharing their data with public databases. So think about it. Now you do a test at one of these other laboratories that's entered the market in June of 2013, You've got access to the sequence information, but you don't have access to the proprietary database that Myriad has generated by doing a million tests in the United States. So we've got an information asymmetry out there, and we've got a proprietary database. What you also have is a whole bunch of companies that are really motivated to share their data so that they can catch up to Myriad and offer clinical testing for BRCA1 and 2. So that's the situation that starts in 2013. And it's trying to find space between the proprietary extreme and the open science extreme. And can we safely share data in a set of structures that will allow us to interpret the clinical meaning of genomic information? And here's the situation as of about two years ago. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a diagram we're not ever going to be able to replicate because it was just a snapshot. But the thing to notice here is I've said that there are 20,000 variants as of, I just checked this yesterday. This is the number from yesterday. 20,644 variants that have been discovered in these two very large genes um, that might be associated with cancer or might not be associated with cancer. When you do a test, you're likely to find one of the common variants that was first discovered. And those are going to be in all of the databases that we know about on the planet. That's like Angelina Jolie's uh, mutation, for example, is here, or Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the congresswoman 
uh, who's a champion of BRCA testing in the House of Representatives. Those are going to be the common ones, and those are in all the databases. But look at the outer lobes of these are the five major public databases that exist on the planet for sharing information. And what you see is that a very large fraction of the variants that have been discovered are only in one of those databases. Moreover, when the uh, Chinese started surveying, they, they went out and they sequenced people who got breast and ovarian cancer and said, are we going to find mutations? And yes, they did find mutations. And when they looked for those mutations in the public databases, 40% of the time, they were not there. So what does that tell you? It tells you we're still discovering new mutations that we don't know how to interpret. And when we do discover them, they tend to end up in a database that's only one of many databases that's available. The reason we can't do this diagram again is that now all these databases are beginning to share. And this is why that decision matters. The pathogenic variants are only this about a fourth of the variants that have been discovered. Those are the ones we know how to interpret, and those are disease-associated. The vast majority have not been vetted by experts to say, we've got enough data to say, say this causes disease or it doesn't. <laughs> so we've got to reduce the size of this wedge of the pie over the next 10 years. And the only way we're going to do that is by using the data. So in the real world, the BRCA exchange has begun to pool all this information. And another database that was created in 2013 has been set up by the National Library of Medicine to collect information about what are the variants in all of the genes in the human genome, and what's the evidence that we know about whether they can be clinically interpreted, and links between those two things. So you don't need anybody's name, or address, or, or where they live. All you need is the variant and the evidence for whether that variant is clinically meaningful. That's been deposited in the uh, database called ClinVar. And we have an organization. That's the other miraculous thing that happened in 2013. A group of people said, we've got a collective action problem. Let's solve it. How do you solve a collective action problem? Well, you read Eleanor Ostrom, and she tells you, form a community, start talking to each other. And that's what they started to do. Um, and the Global Alliance uh, is about to have, I think it's six plenary uh, next week in Switzerland. So that's where we are. So what's this got to do with? policy and stuff like that. We're, as a matter of study, trying to figure out how do we build this commons, and if we can build the commons, how do we make sure that it's sustainable over the long term? And think about it. What are some of the policy problems we're going to confront? One that we have completely given up on is, wouldn't it make sense if there were just one funder that would build the infrastructure and create the capacity for doing this? But if you wanted to do that, where would it be located? Well, we don't know. It would certainly be international, because the uses of this data are global. Um, but think of it. Who pays for international science? Think about CERN. And don't think about it too hard, because if you're a CERN administrator, what do you spend your time doing? You spend your time going to Germany and the US and J Japan and Italy and France, asking for money every year. And some years they give it, and some years they don't. It's a it's a very unstable funding source. There is no funding, international funding source that we've come up with. All those initiatives that we listed are generally funded through either nonprofits or through national funding streams. So we're not even trying to solve that problem. What we are trying to solve is the problem of how do we get people to share their data. Um, and there are two prongs to the policy uh, solutions that we're working on. One is, to make sure that as we're designing this system, we make sure that the rights and interests of the people whose data are in the databases are, are respected and honored in the process of designing the system. So why is that an issue? Well, that's an issue because almost all the databases that we've constructed have been built out of research for researchers, for their purposes, and they are operated as though the data are owned by research institutions that have gotten the grants and the contracts to do that work. And it's not that they're evil, although sometimes they can be. It's that they don't have strong incentives to make sure that the people who 
really, really need the information to make decisions about the genes in their bodies have access to it and can make interpretations independently. So we actually don't have a system that says you actually have a right to get access to your data, and if it's wrong, you can fix it, and moreover, we're going to build the tools that you need to be able to interpret it. That will not happen of its own accord. So that's one prong. And the other is, let's make sure that the people who are playing this game have the right set of incentives to make sure that the commons will be preserved. Um, and so how do you do that? Well, the idea that's kind of floating around, but it is not policy, is, you know what? We're paying for these clinical tests through health insurance, through Medicare, through Medicaid, through public coffers and health accounts. And we're saying that you can't really reliably interpret the data unless it's out there for experts to be able to see. But we've allowed proprietary databases to come into being. Well, you know what? Medicare can say, we're not going to pay for your test unless you share the data that now allows us to verify that you've done a good, accurate interpretation. That's a move that the Centers for Medicare Services, Medicare and Medicaid Services could make. They haven't done it. The accreditors of laboratories could do that. FDA could do that as they begin to regulate these tests. They're on the precipice of doing that. It's been a debate that's been going on since the 1980s. And professional organizations are beginning to pass statements. The American Medical Association has said it's unethical to sit on data that need to be used for clinical interpretation of genomic variants. It hasn't mattered. Nobody's been held to account for it. But the ethical norm has been established by the AMA. So, and there are some other things that we can do. And this is where a lot of work is going on. It's at the tech level. Let's make sure that it's easy to share the data. Um, and let's set it up so that the data, which have information about people and individuals, like, think about this. You discover a gene, a, a variant that says you're at high risk of breast and ovarian cancer. And let's say you have kids. And let's say your data are out there on the internet. And somebody can link them to you. Well, somebody could go to your daughter in her junior high school class and say, hey, I see your mom has this variant of breast cancer. Are you going to get breast cancer? You probably don't want your daughter to find out about that kind of information. You don't want an insurance getting access to that information unless you have control of it. So these are private data. And for the most part, the private data are housed in repositories where they were generated, the laboratories, the clinical health systems, et cetera. They need to be really secure, held with privacy rights, and used only in accord with the donation that the people uh, put them into the databases in the first place with. And uh, in foreign countries, they're really worried about the rich countries from the north, yet again exploiting resources. So they're passing laws that say you can't export genomic information without permission of the government. So all of these issues are saying the data have to stay in place. So what are we going to do? Well, we have a solution to that, which is send the software around, pull the information you need out to make a clinical interpretation, deposit that in a public database, but leave the data where they belong. That sounds easy, but it's really, really technically complicated. But that's where we are. And those, are, those things are pieces of software that, that are called dockers, and they move around. Um, and they pull information, but they don't pull the information that is private and um, needs to stay that way. So we need, in order to be able to do that, think about it, somebody needs to push a button saying, yes, we will allow that piece of software into our system. Well, somebody who's developing that software has to say, you can trust us. We have vetted the people. They're going to play by the rules. And we're only going to use it for the purpose that we've specified. So you need to do some institutional design, a la Eleanor Ostrom, in order to allow people to exploit that. So that's what we've been working on. It's a work in progress. Um, as of yesterday, a group of advocates are trying to get a grant uh, modeled in part on what Eric, uh, Eric Johnson has been doing with the uh, artificial pancreas work. Um, it's coming through ASU precisely because ASU has used his model of advocate-driven science. To, and ASU has made it very friendly. And so the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is uh, considering a grant to help the advocates build the, the social infrastructure and the technical infrastructure that they feel is safe for sharing information about themselves. Um, and that's one of the topics that we're dealing with. 
and this is where we stand. <laughs> so, questions? Uh, Bob, could you go back to the slide where you have the overlapping databases? Yeah. That rate of uniqueness makes me suspicious about measurement issues. Is it possible? Uh, do, do all of these databases collect the information and report the information the same way? Um, are, are there set rules about how they do it and where, where, they, where do they come from? So you guys have studied this issue. What's the answer to that question? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so the, now, the, 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 no is the right answer. Um, but it's a really pretty circumscribed right answer. So, so here's the thing. DNA sequencing is pretty damn reliable. So most of these variants are going to be real variants. And they really are going to be unique in databases. Now why is that? How do you explain something that's, how is it that you would have so many unique variants that only end up in one place? That's because we find the common ones really early. And what we're discovering is the variants that are in the long tail. They're really rare. Like 0.1% of the population would have that variant. So if you're doing genetic testing, you may have to do a million tests before you come across that variant. And in order to interpret that variant, you're going to have to come across it more than once. So what you're seeing here is this is just a sequence that's been reported as we have the sequence. But we don't know what it means. We've come across it, and it's in our database, but you can't make any inference about it. That's why we have to pool it. So it, it probably isn't very much measurement error at the level of sequence. There are zillions of errors in the interpretation of that sequence. If you go out to the labs, we just did a survey of the labs. We, we, we called people up on the phone and said, you're a lab, you're doing BRCA testing. In We, we called. 14 labs in foreign countries and eight labs in the United States and databases all over the world and said, what do you do when you come across these variants? And they're all saying, we go to ClinVar and we look at the same databases. So they're looking, these data have now been pooled into consolidated databases, but they are the tools that they've got. Um, and what they're doing is basically saying, we're all using more or less the same resources to interpret. That does not mean that you can interpret it. Remember that pie chart on the next graph of all these variants that <coughs> we don't know how to interpret yet. And that's going to get worse before it gets better because that long tail, the more testing we do and the more populations. The other thing that's really interesting about a lot of human genetics, think about it. This is a set of diseases that happen generally after you've had kids. You get breast and ovarian cancer after you've had kids. So put yourself in Darwin's situation, survival of the fittest. Is there strong selection pressure against these genes because you can't reproduce if you have these variants? No, there isn't. So why are these mistakes accumulating in the human genome? Well, there's, they generally, almost all of the pathogenic variants have very different patterns of inheritance in different populations. So all of us have heard of the three variants, you can get tested for $100 at 23andMe. And that does account for about 90, 95% of the risk of families if they're of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. So it's not a bad screening test in the United States. But you take that same test and you give it to people in Iceland and you're missing the main mutation in Iceland that accounts for most inherited breast and ovarian cancer in Iceland, which is a completely different variant. And we found isolated mutations that are associated with populations in Mexico, in a tribe in Ontario. These are mutations that are inherited by a founder effect. That is, somebody had it, they pass it on, and it just keeps accumulating because it doesn't cause people not to have kids. So there's no selection pressure against it. It's a very unusual pattern, but what we have to do now, we've, we've sampled European and North American populations pretty well. But what we haven't done is survey populations in China, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in Latin America. So the places where we haven't done genetic testing yet are the places we're going to find a lot of variants that we don't know how to interpret until we accumulate a lot of information about those populations. So that's another wrinkle on top of all the other complicated stuff I've talked about. 
sorry for the length of those answers. Have I exhausted you guys completely? <laughs> Yeah, what would be the incentives for companies <coughs> or governments, the incentives to for companies or governments to do this kind of research in Latin America or in Africa? So, the, what's the the question was what's the incentive for places to do research that would enable this to happen? Let me parse that into two things. What are the incentives for doing it in the first place? Um, and that incentive is the same as it is for any other disease. Uh, cancer's a pretty big deal everywhere. And breast and ovarian cancer is number three or four in most countries in the world. And this is a this is a form of breast cancer and ovarian cancer you can actually do something about. So you actually can prevent it in those people who are at high risk if you've got good tests. Number that's number one. Number two, we're going to be doing a lot of testing because it's getting a lot cheaper, and it's going to be happening all over the world. So we're going to have to go through this cycle of interpreting the tests. It's a new technology. It's an emerging technology, so there's an incentive to do that. The second question is, what's the incentive to share data? Which is the hard question to answer, because the incentives right now are pretty close to zero. When we talk, talk to these labs, we're saying, they're, and they're spending, incidentally, a, a, an Ambry Genetics or an Invite Genetics, they tell us they're spending about a million to two million dollars a year just to make their data available to public databases, because they have to hire the people to put the data into a format that can go into the public databases. So you have to hire those people and pay them, and, and it costs time and energy. So the incentive that they're telling us is, well, we have this unusual situation where Myriad had a service monopoly, and so those companies actually had a strong incentive to cooperate. We wouldn't normally see that in the real world, but they had an incentive to catch up to Myriad so that they can say that our test is as good as Myriad's. So that's their incentive. At the national level, that same question is out there. And the answer to that question is, you know what? People in your country have these diseases, and you're not going to be able to interpret what their risks are unless you pool the information from all over the world and let experts have at it. So that's that's the main incentive. Yeah? A question about the definition of the laboratories. Were you using laboratories that just do specific panels, or that do whole genome? where they're looking at all of the marker, biomarkers of the cancer patient sample? Uh, mainly, so, so what's happened in genetic testing, especially after the Supreme Court, is most lab, in fact, even Marriott, no longer does two genes. They do, they're now at 28. They test for 28 cancer-associated genes at Marriott. Other labs do 30, others do 50, whatever. Um, the data we're talking about are actually data about variants. So they might be discovered by exon sequencing or whole genome sequencing, or they might be discovered by panels. Panels are by far the largest source of data now. Um, and where the technology has gone is basically what you do is you sequence a set of genes between usually 20 and 50 genes, and you sequence them entirely, 30-fold over or something like that. And you look for spelling differences that are consistent in that particular patient. And those data go into a database. And all we're seeing, the flow of data is that goes into a database with the variant call files. And then that information gets transferred to the public database once somebody has made a clinical inference about it. Or once somebody has said, we've come across this variant and we know that it's in our database and we're sure that it's there. But it can come from any of those sources because it's only at the level of the variant. Yeah? A question about about the, the lab, but from uh, who manufactures the equipment? When, when you have an idea, do you go to the manufacturer and say, I need you to design this for me, or does the manufacturer look at what's happening in the market, design you know, the analyzer, the, you know, whatever it is, how, you know, where does the idea for the equipment to do the tests come from? So that sounded like a simple question. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to give you a complicated answer because you're getting used to me. I give really long, complicated answers to every question. Um, when the Human Genome Project was being conducted, there was only one company that did all the, that supplied the DNA sequencing instruments for both Celera and for the Public Genome Project. So everybody was buying instruments from the same company. 
um, and there was only one real manufacturer. That was a long time ago. What happened in 2004 is the technology base for doing DNA sequencing shifted to a variety of sequencing methods that had all cropped up, and there are five or six of those, um, and that continues to evolve. Um, and there are different manufacturers of the sequencing machines and the microarray machines that detect DNA differences. So there are probably two dozen sources of the instruments that are creating the information, and there are hundreds of companies that do the next step, which is build the software to interpret the sequence differences, to make sure that, if you think about DNA sequence, you've got the information <coughs> that you see coming out of the DNA itself. That's the raw sequence. But before you can say this is the sequence that's in your body, you have to stitch together sequences that are short in length and put them together. Mm -hmm. So that's called sequence assembly. So you put together a string that's longer than any particular individual read. And then you have to compare that sequence assembly to the reference database and say, here's where the variants are. This is where your sequence <laughs> differs from the reference sequence. That's a whole other package of software. And then once you've done that, you have to say, and your sequence difference matters in the following way, and here's the evidence that we have that it matters clinically. We've just gone through four layers of sequence data interpretation. And there are companies at every one of those layers doing the interpretation. And you in a lab can pick any of three or four packages of software or companies to help you at each step of that way. So it's not very simple at all. And there's not a whole lot of leverage on the, on the manufacturers. There is leverage on them in, in terms of accuracy, speed, and cost. There's a lot of competition there. But uh, the competition for quality of interpretation is what we really care about. And that's distributed about, among a whole lot of private and public players uh, all over the world. So it is complicated. It's, it's inevitably complicated, and it's going to stay that way. Last question. So what other diseases like this have a similar problem that's where they have enough data where they even know what they're doing, or type CA1 in particular? I, I heard some things from recent studies that uh, part of the reason there might be uh, that we might have more issues now is that because there, there's fewer pregnancies, that having more pregnancies might have protected against cancer at some point in the past. I don't know if there's any, anything Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's a actually. completely different question about breast cancer risk. We actually don't really understand what causes breast cancer, except in the few cases where we can tell a molecular story of, of genetics. But uh, there are, And there are lots of plausible things that are being researched. But to your first question, and thank you for asking that question, because it allows me to make another point. Why would we do all this work on BRCA1 and 2? Well, the reason we're doing it here is this is one of the places where the wave is going to break. We know that we have to solve this problem for all of the 19 or 20,000 genes that there are in the human genome. But these are two of the genes that have been most thoroughly studied. The scientific world created the databases that we can draw on to kind of say, here's the prototype, and here's what we have to do to make what we've done already work to reach the outcomes that we care about. And that's most likely to happen when you've got the infrastructure in place. What we are really, really hoping is that there are many other conditions. Cystic fibrosis has its own database that's housed at Johns Hopkins. Uh, the epilepsies have their own database. But all of this stuff at some point has to come to a central database with a central system for interpreting the clinical aspects and what we're hoping is that by solving the set of social and legal problems for BRCA, we'll be paving the road for other constituencies that don't have the political firepower that breast cancer advocates have to interact with the political system and solve their problems. So we're hoping that we set up a prototype that other disease groups can replicate in order to solve the same set of problems. So there are many other conditions that are going to face the some, same problem. Many of them haven't even quite figured that out yet. So thank you. So um, the next Enlightening Lunch, October 3rd.
will be Craig Calhoun. We won't be in this room. We'll be in uh, Memorial Union Gold Room. Uh, Craig is a new uh, university professor affiliated with SFIS and four other units on campus. Uh, he's the former president of the London School of Economics and president of the Social Science Research Council. Should be a great talk. And thank you again, Bob. Yeah.